the Spirit of God to be with us again. Father, we just come before the throne of grace. We thank you for what you're showing us in the first session. And Lord, we ask you to continue in the second session. Give us further illumination. Make it very simple to us. We ask that you activate in us the mind of Christ. And Lord, we thank you for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Let's go right back to what we were looking at in the first session about when did the reign of the Lord Jesus Christ really begin in the earth. Um, I've never done this in reverse before, but I feel led to do this because I know that there's many that will be hearing these tapes and you here that need uh, to walk in victory, amen, and need to change your life to become snapped until you begin to see it as God says it, you'll find yourself really in, in warfare and conflict against God and what he has provided for you and for, and for me. We've already seen in Colossians 2 that Jesus disarmed the rulers and authorities. We've already seen in Ephesians 1, he was raised up far above every principality, all powers, all dominion, all might in this age and also the one to come. As I said to you earlier in the second chapter, I think we'll look at that in the second session, that when he was raised up, we were raised up. Now, None of us saw ourselves being raised up. Everything that we receive from the Lord is on the basis of faith. Amen? We've also established in the first session, in Revelation chapter 1, that everything that John saw, let's go right back there and look at it again, and then go back into the 20th chapter, and pick up what we saw in session 1. In Revelation chapter 1, we see here very clearly, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. We know that he's the Lord of glory. But you must begin to just meditate on that. He's the Lord of all glory. He's not a man, as we know a natural man to be. He is man, yes, from the standpoint of humanity. He was born as one of us, but he's also God. He's God in the flesh, in human form. This is the revelation. This is the revelation of his glory. This is the revelation of his resurrection. This is the revelation of him with all authority, all power, and all dominion and might. This is a revelation of he that is now ruling and reigning as king over the universe in every circumstance, in every situation, in my life and in your life. And everything that's ever happened to me since coming to Christ, he's been in charge of it. Because he's out to do a work within me. Amen? This is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him, gave Jesus, to show to his bond servants. And I'm going to say something to you. Every bond servant that's shown this will see it and understand it. And don't think I don't seem to recognize the fact that what I am saying is so radically opposed to what the so-called prophecy experts have to say. That's not something new. When the apostles came on the scene, they went through the same thing. Jesus himself went through the same thing. And so is it some strange phenomenon that we, his servants today, will also be exposed to the same thing? No, it's not at all. The Bible says, he showed to his bondservant the things which must shortly take place. The things which must shortly take place are the things that begin to take place under his power, under his might, under his dominion. That means the things that will take place in this earth with him ruling and reigning. He sent and communicated or signified it or gave it to him in a language of signs and symbols and riddles and parables by his angel to his bondservant, John. And look what John says. He says it bore witness to, would you please read out loud to me the next four words? Word. The word of God. Can I point something out to you? The only word that John had was the Old Testament. Everything he saw in the revelation of Jesus, he also had seen it in the word that he had at his disposal. And he goes on to say, not only to bear witness to the word of God, but also to the what? Testimony of who? Of Jesus. Now, let, let's see what else he goes on to say. Even to how much that he saw? Folks, how much is all? That means everything he saw in signs and symbols was pointing to what? The word of God and the revelation of Jesus Christ. Is that plain? Think about it. And all he had was the Old Testament. Let's go back to Revelation 20 and pick up where we left off the first session. 
We've seen very clearly. But yes, it does say that Satan will be bound for a thousand years. That's where we left off in session one. And let's see what's bound by the devil. He threw him into the abyss. We know this had to be Jesus because we saw that Michael the Archangel didn't have that authority. We know there was only Jesus that gave testimony in Matthew 28 that all power in heaven and earth was in his hand and that word key means authority. It's a symbol. It's a riddle. Amen? And it's in the language of what we just read in Revelation 1.1. Here's the power of the devil that's broken. And I won't, don't want you to miss it. Verse 3 will tell you the power of Satan that's broken. He threw him into the abyss. He shut it and sealed it over him so that he should not do what? Deceive. That's the power of the devil that's broken, his power to deceive. If you'll stand on the word, his power of deception over your life will be broken. Didn't say that he won't run the earth anymore and wor uh, work havoc. Doesn't say there's going to be peace on the earth from then on. Doesn't say that anywhere. It just says that the power that was broken was his power of deception. That's why I went to the Philippines and preach to those people who worship Mary, and they have a degree of Catholicism you wouldn't believe. They crucify themselves and everything else. It's incredible. And when I start sharing with them the reality of Jesus Christ and not Mary, I made an altar call. So many came forward, but I said to myself, they probably don't understand what I'm saying. When I went to the prisons, the worst prison they had there, Bilabad in, in the Philippines, in Manila, and went on death row and spoke to all those inmates going to die. And I made an altar call. They all came to Jesus. We did the same thing in prison yards. I preached to whole pr crowds of them on both sides of me. And I said, how many want this? You just stand. They all stood. Why? Because the power of deception is broken wherever the word of God is preached and accepted and received. That's the binding of the devil. His power to deceive. Many times when you and I were in our different religious backgrounds. I can think, for example, when we were Baptists. First, you know, my family came out of the Catholic Church. Then we, we just started running the gamut of it. Then we became Baptists. Then we became Methodists. Then we became Pentecostal. Then we became Charismatic. Finally, we got set free, and now we're just Jesus people. And in each one of them, that was some denominational uh, altar building around. We got more truth than everybody else because we do these things. Some didn't believe in healing. Some didn't believe that the days of miracles has passed away. But when the truth came in, all that deception was broken. I remember when I used to, as a little boy, watch these, these saints jump and shout and jerk and, and, and flop and everything else. I thought that was the Holy Ghost. Didn't realize it was their flesh. <laughs> out of control because of what they heard from a pulpit. I remember when I was in charismatic circles and watched them going down under the power because they were told by a man, if you don't fall down while they lay hands on you, you have no faith. I did all those stupid things. And one day the light came and I was set free. Are you hearing me? I remember when I used to hear preachers holler and shout with a song in their voice. And I kept saying, I'm trying to understand what the guy is saying. <laughs> and one day it dawned on me, just, just as, a, as a kid, the Lord said to me, when I spoke, I spoke in such a way that even the children understood me. And something dawned on me. This doesn't mean it's the spirit of God. That's flesh. That's zeal of man. Showmanship. To hold the people of God in captivity. Can I tell you something? It's the same thing that's done in Africa with the witch doctors. But listen to me. It's this power that's broken. The power to hold God's people in deception is broken. Here's the power. He should not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were complete, or you might say the day of salvation has been completed. And I'm going to prove it in Hebrews, okay? After these things, he must be released for a short time. Look at verse 4. Now, I got a question for you. Where is Christ seated? On a what? Throne. Everybody say on the throne. On the throne. Now, if you and I were raised up with him and we're seated with him, what are we seated on? Oh, how about that? Look at verse 4. Remember, it's a symbolic language, is it not? And I saw thrones, and they set upon them, and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded. Can I tell you something? I've been beheaded so many times by gossip and slander. It doesn't even bother me anymore. Guess what? So are you. 
You know, it's known that our church is off on the deep end. That we preach too much about sin and judgment and the fear of God. We're a church of outcasts and rejects. We don't have, we don't attract important people here. We've had two or three millionaires come among us. And they've come and just offered to buy me out, literally. I've been, I've been offered everything, Mercedes Benz. The latest offer, someone offered me $200,000 if I wouldn't preach this message. And some of the people who've kicked out were people with money. And the staff who can tell you that. We're beheaded. We're literally talked about so bad that people think that we're crazy. The, the word for beheaded is martyr. And that's what the Bible says. Ensure you be witnesses of me. It talks about when you receive the Holy Ghost, you become a martyr. You don't live for the world or what people think anymore. You live for just Jesus Christ. That's a martyr. And you are supposed to be living as a dead man, dead to this world, the things of the world. That you have a new mind, the mind of Christ, heavenly minded. And then Satan's got a beautiful thing for that one. He says, you better watch it now. You read too much of that Bible. You can become so heavenly minded that you know earthly good. You ever heard that one? It's amazing the catchphrase he comes up with. Wonderful logic. I'm going to say something to you. You better become heavenly minded or you'll be no earthly good. <laughs> God said those that are earthly minded and worldly minded are enemies of the cross. He says they are hostile in mind. They can't subject themselves to the law of God. They're enemies. Why were they beheaded? Look what it says. Because of the what? Testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God. And who are these people? There are those who had not worshipped the beast or his image. You think he's talking about people going to a church somewhere and there's a big beast up there and they're bowing down and saying, oh, I worship you, oh, great, beautiful, high beast. No, it's a symbol. It means that they're really worshipping Satan and they don't even know it. They don't even know it. That's what it's talking about in Romans 12 when it says, don't be confounded by this world, shaped to this world. But we be renewed in the spirit of what? Your mind. Oh, how about that? Look what he goes on to say. They, would, they had not received the mark upon their forehead. You know what the mark of the beast is? It's a mind that gossips, that slanders, that walks in sin, that imagine lustful thinking. The mind of Lucifer, the mind of wickedness. And the Bible says, and they didn't receive it upon their hands. You see? See, look, notice me. Look, look. Whenever you read about the service of God, they're never marked on their hands. Never. You know why? Because their hands don't belong to them. And they don't do anything in their own strength. Because it's not by power, it's not by might, but it's by my spirit, says the Lord. And they only go in the mind of Christ. They go forth, and Christ in them does all the work. They, does no, they do nothing in their own sweat. The life they live is a rest in Christ, and he rules and reigns. But those that have the mind of Satan, they do everything they can to please themselves. You understand that? They're marked. This number 666 is not some stamp that somebody's going to be stamping you in the head or stamping you on the hand. It's the spirit. It's the way you think. It's a depraved mind. And the mind of God is 777. And you're going to see that the number of six is the number of man. That means you can have all the sixes spread across the board you can think of. It means no matter what man does, in the greatness of his power and strength, it can never come to the number seven, which is the number of God. That's all it means. Remember, everything he saw was in symbols, figurative language, riddles, parables. You must begin to see everything from the mind of God. The number 1,000 here. Can I tell you what it means? It simply means salvation. The time when the reign and the rule of Jesus is one of salvation, that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord while he's reigning and ruling, they shall be saved. That's all it means. I'm going to prove it in Hebrews, okay? So the number 1,000 can stand for how many days? Shout it out to me. One day. Everybody say it. One day. So it's okay to interchange those because it's what the Bible says. Is that not so? Don't forget that one day. One day. Okay. And they came to life. When you came to Jesus Christ, did you come to life? Yes. Does the Bible say they were dead in our transgressions, in our sins? Oh, so when you come to life, it must mean you got set free from your transgressions and sins, right? 
And the Bible says they did what with Christ? They reigned with Christ where? For a thousand years. Oh! But Christ is reigning and ruling over what? Principalities and powers and rulers of darkness of this world. Right? Yeah, how about that? In fact, let me give you a reference for that. Hold your place. I'm going to come right back just real quick. Go to Revelation 5. I've never taught this in reverse before. I'm doing it in reverse. I hope you don't mind that. Revelation 5, verse 9 and 10. Again, it points to his death, burial, and resurrection. Let me say something about Revelation. It is not written in chronological order. It goes back and forth like a big clock. It points to the cross. It points to him on the throne. It points to what he's doing and why he's reigning and ruling. It goes back and forth, back and forth. Are oh, you listening to me? That's why you can't read it and say, well, right here now he's got to be coming because this is taking place. He says, no man will know the hour. And the way he wrote this book, no man will still know the hour. Does he talk about a rapture, a catching away? Yes, he does. But again, he doesn't do it in a sequence, chronological event type of thing. Let me say this to you. The rapture, if you want to call it that, is the very last thing that will take place upon this earth. And after that comes nothing but fire and judgment and destruction, not the setting up of a kingdom. It's over. Okay? Look what it says here. In Revelation 5, verse 9, And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy art thou to take the book. We're going to talk about that book. And to break its seals. The seals, I can tell you this in advance, is all the events that's taken place on this world since the time that he's been reigning and ruling. And at the same time, there's a protection for God's people. And some will be destroyed, but God already told us that. For thou was slain. Was he slain at Calvary? See, again, notice it brings in the cross. And did purchase for God. Did purchase for God? Yeah, the Bible says that in 1 Peter chapter 1. Know that you were not what? Redeemed with perishable things like silver and gold, but you were what? Purchased or redeemed with what? The precious blood as of a lamb, without spot or blemish. See, notice, notice that. Without a purchase from God, men from what? Every tribe and tongues and people and nation, and thou hast made them to be a kingdom. Oh, wait a minute. Wait, 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 stop, stop. Would you all stand with me? I just want to do this to make a point. Now, you'll remember when you read this that you remember standing up and saying this with me. Where is the kingdom of God? Where? Point to yourself. Within us, right? When we're all together, you know what, what's really here? The kingdom of God. And you're out in your jobs and everywhere else, and you're sitting there, it's the kingdom of God sitting there. And he also said, a priest. What does, what does priest deal with? Sin. That's a commission telling every person you meet, your sins have been forgiven you. Doesn't that sound strange to say that? Look at the person next to you and say, your sins have been forgiven you. Just say it. Kingdom, priests, under God. And they will reign with him and rule whereabouts. What does it say in the rest of your Bible? Read the rest of that verse. You can be seated, please. Upon the earth. Now, that reigning and ruling upon the earth, people, is not in some far fetched 1,000 year reign as man sees it. It's reigning and ruling over every attempt of Satan to cause you to do that which is against God. You walk above it. You walk above the assaults that Satan uses men to bring against your life. You walk above it. Why? Because you're ruling and reigning with him in heavenly places. Does that make sense to you? Well, I'll tell you what, go back to Revelation 20 and look what it says. First of all, we see that it's not really waiting until we get to heaven to rule with him, right? It's ruling and reigning upon the earth. Is that right? Now go back to Revelation, Revelation 20. Verse 4, the B part. They came to life. That means the time when you got saved. And they reigned with Christ for what? A thousand years or the day of salvation, right? The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. Until what was completed? 
And now he tells you something else about the thousand years. He says, this is the what? Oh, so the thousand years, now we know another point. It's also called the first resurrection. Well, let's see what he says about the first resurrection. Verse 6, blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the what? First resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for how long? A thousand years. Now we come to verse 7. This will tell you what was going to take place with Satan. And when the thousand years are completed, which means when the day of salvation is over, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth. It gives you their name, Gog and Magog, to get them together for the war. The number of them is like the sand of the seashore. And they came up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. Well, first of all, we need to find out what he's talking about. Can I tell you what he's talking about in very simple, simplified for you? Remember, when he wrote this, even the most uneducated Christian understood it and rejoiced. I've got a question for you. I want you to be honest with me. How many of y'all have dared to open your mouth to family members or even the people in your job and told them you have totally turned your life over to Jesus Christ? Got a question. How they, re how they react? Weird. Was it almost like pressure to make you become like them again? Okay, you catch what I'm saying though? But you catch what normally happens to you? See, they begin to come against you. He stirs them up to come against you. They're part of that army of Gog and Magog. I told you before, the battle of Armageddon has been taking place ever since Jesus ascended up into glory. And the whole world will end up literally turning against all the saints of God. For example, it says they surrounded the beloved city. Who do you think the beloved city is? What do you think that spiritual Jerusalem is? The heavenly Jerusalem is? Who do you think it is? Anybody got any ideas? It's us. Now, we're going to let the word of God prove that, aren't we? Because you see, we got many waiting for that thousand years saying, I'm waiting for that heavenly Jerusalem to come down. Can I help you? When you said, Jesus, save me. The new life and the new world was birthed in you. That's what it says, sister. That's right. He says, over these, the second death has no power. And you're going to see what the second death is. Can I tell you what the second death is? It's being thrown into hell for all eternity. Let's keep going. Now, he's going to tell you what the outcome of Satan is going to be in this book. And fire came down from heaven and devoured them, and the devil, verse 10, was who deceived them. Catch that. His power to deceive is restored. You know why? Because the world rejected what he provided at Calvary. Can I tell you what, what makes you deceived? Anytime you're deceived, it's when you're rejecting what has been already been provided for you at Calvary. That's what caused us to walk in deception. Can I tell you something else that causes us to become deceived? When we subject our lives and submit our lives to men that claim they know God, and we bow the lies and the doctrines they teach us. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the fire, the lake of fire, brimstone, where the beast and the false prophets are, and they will be torment day and night and forever. And I saw a great white throne in him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the who? The dead. Now, folks, now, let me show you something else strange about these dead folks. This is the strangest bunch of dead people I have ever read about in my entire life. When I first read this, it tested my brains. I kept saying, he saw some dead folks standing up. What happened? Were we watching something called Weird and watching our stories about a bunch of zombies? No, he said, you're dead in your transgressions and your sins. These are people who never received what he provided for them at Calvary. And that's who's at this judgment. He's telling what's going to happen to them. Look what it says. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, and what were the dead people doing? Standing. When have you seen a dead man stand up? Standing before the throne, and books were open. I don't mind telling you, 
You and I have probably committed enough sin to fill up all the books of heaven. But that don't matter anymore because the blood has set us free from that writing. The pages are blank there now for us. That is, if you walk in all the light you need to walk in. And another book was opened, which is the book of what? Life. And the dead, that's those that died in their sins, were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which was in them, and they were judged every one of them according to their deeds, and death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. And this is the what? Second death, the lake of fire. And here's the key. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown where? Into the lake of fire. Does that make sense to you? All I want you to really major on right now is that Satan was bound when Jesus began his reign and his ruling. Now, I need to give you some more scripture for that, don't I? Now, I got a question for you. If Jesus told you something in plain English before he left this earth, would you believe him? Especially if he told you something about it before he died and gave you a clue what would happen to Satan when he died, would you believe it? Now, we've already seen here that Satan was bound for a thousand years. Is that right? Would you please go to John 16 and see if this all makes sense to you? John chapter 16. Folks, are you following me so far? Okay. John chapter 16. See, I don't see how some people can stay in their dead churches and keep eating this slop they've been eating for all these years. I'm going to tell you something. God's going to pour out his power on this earth one last time. But it's going to be for just a short testimony who the people of God really are. And I want to be found in that, in that bunch. I don't know about you. But I know that if he does it, it's, it's going to not be for us to sit around like we've been doing in these camps, saying, let's go see the power show today. We're going to be out in the streets and the highways and the hedges, exercising that authority. In John 16, these are the words from the lips of Jesus Christ himself. Now, if you don't believe him, just call him a lie. Okay? In John 16, notice what he says in the fifth verse. John 16, verse 5. But now I am going to him who sent me. Will somebody please tell me what that means in plain English? What does that mean? What is he fixing to do? He's fixing to what? Crucify. That's the only way he can get to the Father. Is that right? Through death. He's fixing to die. Now watch what he tells you. He gives you a clue to Revelation chapter 20. Here's, the, here's some of the clues of it. I told you earlier, everything in Revelation is found in the other parts of the Bible. Have I not told you that? Here it is. He says, now I'm fixing to go to him that sent me. And none of you ask me where you're going. But because I've said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. I mean, John 16. Okay? And he goes on and he says, but I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. He's going to die. And he says, for if I do not go away, in other words, if I don't die, the helper or the advocate shall not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness, and don't miss this part, and judgment. Concerning sin, because they don't believe in me, and concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father, and you no longer behold me. And concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world, who is the ruler of this world? Satan. And he says there, he has been judged. That means when I die and go to the Father, I have also taken care of the ruler of this world who is Satan, and I've judged him. I've bound him. Is that another clue for you? If that's not enough, since you're in the book of John, then you go to John 12 and see if this will make sense to you. This is all pointing to Revelation chapter 20, when was Satan bound. John 12, look at verse 20. You ready? Now there were some certain Greeks among those who were going up to worship at the feast. Now these therefore came to Peter, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and began to say, ask him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip came and they told Jesus. And Jesus answered him, saying, The hour has come. For the Son of Man to be what? Glorified. glorified. Folks, is Jesus glorified? 
When was he glorified? Somebody tell me, please. When he rose from the dead. Everybody say, when Jesus rose from the dead, when Jesus rose from the dead he, was he was glorified. Now, in order to rise from the dead, again, it points back to the cross. Is that right? And the book of the Revelation of Jesus is about the glorified Lord, the Lord of glory. Amen? He goes on to say, I'm in that hour where I'm about to die. And he says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains by itself alone, but if it dies, it, it bears much fruit. He who loves his life loses it, and he who hates his life in his world shall keep it to a life eternal. If anyone serves him, let him follow me. And where, I'm, where I am, there shall my servant also be. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Now my soul has become troubled. In other words, now we begin to see his humanity. In other words, I know I'm in the hour I'm going to die. And the human reactions begin to take over. And he says, what shall I say? Because I feel this stress coming on me. Shall I begin to pray this way in selfishness? Father, save me from this hour. Is that what I should do? Look what he says. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. Then he says, Father, glorify thy name, because I'm going to do what you call me to do. There came, therefore, a voice out of heaven. I have both glorified it, and don't miss this, and will glorify it again. The multitude, therefore, who stood by and heard it was saying that it had thundered. Others were saying, an angel spoken to him. And Jesus answered and said, this voice has not come for my sake, but for your sake. Verse 31. Do you dare believe it? I got a question for you. Do you dare believe verse 31? Is Jesus talking about his death? Did I say to you the first act that took place when he rose again from the grave was to bind Satan? Look what it says in verse 31. Now judgment is upon this world, and now the ruler of this world will be what? Cast out. And if I, he says, if I be lifted from the earth, I will now draw all men to myself. But he will send this to indicate the kind of death by which he was to die. Can I make it very simplified for you? Two things took place when Jesus died. Number one, every man was baptized into his death. And number two, Satan was bound and cast down to not deceive them any longer. But we got a doctrine saying, one of these days, Satan will be bound. And we're in danger of doing the very same thing that happened to the Jewish nation when Jesus came in the flesh to a people that spent their everyday lives in the Word of God. What you and I are doing here today in this Bible school is what they did every day of their lives. They learned so much of the Word that when Jesus came, they missed it. And they rejected him. If you go to Israel, I've been there twice, you'll find them before the Western Wall, which would be known as the Welling Wall, and they're bowing up and down, praying the Messiah to come. He's come, and they rejected him. He's delivered us, he has set us free, and we're in danger of saying, I'm waiting for Jesus to come, and to set us free, the cross wasn't enough. I want you to go with me, please, to Revelation, the sixth chapter. Revelation chapter six. Notice with me. Verse five and six. I think I'll do it that way. Let me, um, I was going to get into the seals. Let me just wait on the seals until you've had enough to digest what we're doing so far because I'm sure this is probably heavy for some of you. Let's go back to Ephesians 2. And um, 
continue the theme of what took place when he died. We've already seen that um, he's reigning and ruling. I'll tell you what let's do. Let's go back to Revelation 1. Let's do it that way. Revelation chapter 1. Have I said that when Jesus died, that he broke the power of sin? Good. See, can you buy this one? In Revelation 1, I want to begin at verse 4. John to the seven churches that are in Asia. In other words, this was written to the whole known church world. So this, this letter is not just for their day, it's for our day also. Okay? There was no other churches in this whole world than those seven churches when this was written. That means the whole known church world, that's what that number seven represents. First of all, he says, grace to you. We know that grace is God's power, his might, is that right? His authority, his dominion, his anointing to break every yoke. And peace. Colossians will tell you that the only way peace comes in our lives is through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's his blood that brings peace. From him, that means grace and peace from him, that's Jesus, who is, who was, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. Did I say that everything in this book is symbolic? Folks, how many spirits is there? There's only one spirit. What this simply means is the Holy Ghost who is totally perfected. The number seven means total perfection. See, notice the symbolism. Seven spirits. Somebody try to interpret this in a little thinking, they'll say, that must be seven Holy Spirits. And I've heard one man with a lying doctor, he says, well, there's really seven raptures. Now that doctor begin to sweep. So I'm warning you. And he's wrong. He's deceived. Okay? The Bible says there's one faith, one Lord, one baptism, one spirit. This is from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead. Folks, was he born from the dead? If he's the first, there must be a second and a third and a fourth. Somewhere you in that number. But he's the first of many brethren. Is that right? The firstborn from the dead. Have you been made alive out of your transgressions and sins? Can you say that you're also one of those born from the dead? He's the ruler and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Notice who the real ruler is. To him who loved us. And please read out loud the next five words. And he did what to us? Released us from what? Our sins. How did he do it? By his blood. Look at verse 6. And he has made us to be a kingdom. He made us to be a kingdom. That's the kingdom he rules and reigns over. His people. Priest to his God and Father. To him be glory and the dominion forever and ever. When were you and I made kings and priests? Would you please go to Ephesians chapter 2. I mentioned it earlier, but I want you to see it. Folks, is this making sense to you now? Talk to me. Okay. Any of y'all battling with confusion out there yet? Praise God if you're not. Ephesians 2, notice verse 5 through 7. Ephesians 2, verses 5 through 7. Even when we were dead, not even when God calls us dead, in our transgressions, he made us alive together with him, with Christ. By grace you've been saved, and he raised us up. And seated us with him where? In the heavenly places. And where are they located? In Christ Jesus. That's when you and I were made kings, a kingdom and priests to our God. In order that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of the grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Look what else he did. Go to Psalm 68. I said that when he was raised again from the grave, he bound Satan. And he opened the prison doors and set the prisoners free. Is that right? What happens to a man if this has happened and he stays in his prison? Can I show you? Psalm 68. Because I'm going to show you the purpose of Jesus' dying on the cross was so that you and I could live before the throne from that time forth in heavenly places. In Psalm 68, this took place.
Look at verse 5 and 6. A father of the fathers and a judge for the widows is God in his holy habitation. God makes a home for the lonely. Would you please underline that? He leads out the prisoners into prosperity. You that have my tapes on true faith, you know what prosperity means. It means to have total success with God. It doesn't have one thing to do with material possessions, not one. Okay? You don't have those tapes on true faith. There's only six tapes. Get them. You need to hear them. It will tear up the lies that we've, been, we've all been exposed to in our day. Well, if you lead out the prison to prosperity, how about there's some people that's not set free yet? Why are they not set free? It tells you in the next line. Only the rebellious dwell in a parched land. Do you see that? That means they're still walking in sin. Is that plain? Well, let's see what that, where that place is that's a home for the lonely. Go to Jeremiah 17. Jeremiah 17. Notice with me, please, verses 12 through 14. When Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place for you, if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. My Father's house are many dwelling places. King James says, mansions, which is wrong. It should be dwelling places. Because if it were not so, I would have told you. Is that right? He says, I'm doing this, and where I am, there you may be also. Where is Jesus right now? Is he on the throne? Where are we supposed to be right now? On the throne with him. Is that right? Is it making sense to you? It's places to dwell in him. Now, look what he says. Here's why he died, so you and I could have a right to this place. A glorious, what's that next word? Throne on high from the beginning is the what? Place. That's the place he prepared for us of our sanctuary. Now, when he made this place for us, you better be aware of the next verse. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake thee will be put to what? Shame. And those who turn away on earth will be written down because they have forsaken the fountain of living waters, even the Lord. Is it also in your Bible? It's what's taking place on the earth. Are we forsaking him on the earth by our doctrines? That's why I hate doctrines. I hate them. Because they're enemies of the souls of God's people. And they substitute the lying doctrines of men for salvation. They call it light when it's darkness. Verse 14, heal me, O Lord, and I'll be healed. Save me, and I'll be saved, for thou art my praise. Amen? Look at Psalm 72, and let's look at when he's reigning and ruling. Psalms 72. i got a question for you. Has Jesus ascended up into glory? Talk to me. Yes. Is, when a king goes into glory on a throne, is he, does he go there to reign and rule? Yes. Is he reigning and ruling now? Yes. Let's look at Psalm 72. Here's a prophecy of his reign and his ruling and what's going to happen in that day. Give the king thy judgments, O God. Can I tell you something? That's what that book of seals were. All power held was given to Jesus from the hand of God himself. Okay? Give the king thy judgments, O God. Remember when Jesus came the first time, it said, he didn't come to judge the world. Is that right? But that the world through him could be what? Saved. Remember those scriptures? But when we see him again in his glorified form, guess what? He comes in the robe of a judge. He's got brownish, his feet are like Burnish bronze. Bronze, brass, unto the Bible is judgment. And his judgment comes against every life that rejects what he's provided for them. He comes to judge. His eyes are flames of fire, which means he sees through every false way that we've ever committed before him. He's got white hair. It talks about the white hair of those with wisdom. That means he cannot be fooled. And now he's in his glorified form, and he will execute judgment. Give the king thy judgments, O God, and thy righteousness to the king's son. May he judge thy people with righteousness and thine afflicted with justice. 
that the mountains bring peace to the people and the hills in righteousness, may he vindicate the afflicted of the people, may he save the children of the needy, and may he crush the oppressor. Has Jesus crushed Satan? Didn't he tell us in Genesis that the seed of the woman will bruise the serpent's head? First of all, a woman don't have seed. So what he is saying to us, I'm going to put a seed in a woman that no man will have anything to do with. Is that right? And religion has hated women ever since because she played a big part in bringing Christ into the world. That's why we have all the rules for you women. Don't wear makeup, don't wear this, don't wear that. Religion hates women. Well, when did Jesus do that? Did Jesus do that? See, you're reading Revelation about someone that was wounded. A wound that came, and all of a sudden, the wounded head came back to life. The only thing that brings the wounded head back to life in my life or your life is when we are rejecting the finished works of Calvary. Are you listening to me? But watch what it says. May he crush the oppressor, and let them fear thee while the sun endures for as long as the moon throughout all generations. Talk to talk about Jesus, who's reigning and ruling. May he come down like rain upon the mowed grass, like showers that water the earth. In his days, that means the days of his reigning and ruling, may the righteous flourish, and the abundance of peace of the moon is no more. May he also rule from sea to sea, and from the river to the ends of the earth, let the nomads of the desert bow before him and his enemies lick the dust. Let all the kings of Tarshish and the islands bring present the kings of Sheba and Seba offer gifts. Let all the kings bow down before him. Let all nations serve him. This takes place during the time he's reigning and ruling. For he will deliver the needy when he cries for help. The afflicted also and him who has no helper. He'll have compassion on the poor and the needy. And the lives of the needy he will save. He will rescue their lives from oppression and violence. Their blood will be precious in his sight. So may he live. And may the gold of Seba, Sheba be given to him. And let them pray for him continually. Let them bless him all day long. May there be an abundance of grain on the earth on top of the mountains. It's fruit like waves, like the cedars of Lebanon. And may those from the city flourish like the vegetation of the earth. May his name endure for how long? Forever. May his name do what? Increase as long as the sun shines. Let all men bless themselves by him. Let all the nations call him blessed. Blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel, who alone works wonders. And blessed be his glorious name forever. And may the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. When he said, go out and all the world and preach the gospel, that's how the whole earth became filled with his glory. You and I represent part of his glory in the earth that have received the gospel and turned our lives truly over to him. Now, we read about, in Revelation 20, about Gog and Magog. I know that tree was Russia, didn't he? <laughs> I told you, everything in this book is symbolic. Now, let me show you something. It said they would surround his city. Remember that? Can I show you the city? Let's see when did you and I become this city. Go to Hebrews 12. I've taught this before, but I think this time you'll see it in a better light because we're tying it all together. Hebrews 12. And Zion is not something new. We've read about Zion all through the Old Testament. We know that natural Zion was a place that was a satanic stronghold. And this king bragged and said to David, you ain't going to come in here. You've conquered all the other things. I say things Satan was telling you. Here's an area of your life you'll never be able to overcome. He's a liar. You'll never be able to put this problem down. He's a liar. It has already been put down. You stand and say, I proclaim victory over you in Jesus' name. I stand in Christ against you. And so David did something unusual. This king said, I'll use my weakest warriors against you and defeat you. You can't defeat me. Zion was a real place. And David went through the water gates, which means a type of the Holy Spirit. He went through the water gates and totally destroyed that stronghold 
and he made that stronghold become his stronghold. And so we come to Hebrews because we read about Zion and Revelation also. We know that it's all symbolic. So Hebrews gives us the solving of this riddle, of this heavenly Jerusalem. I saw the heavenly Jerusalem coming down from above. That was you, your life coming into you from heaven. You and I were born from above. Is that right? How about that? Look what it says here. You've come to Mount Zion, verse 22, Hebrews 12, 22. And you've come to the city of the living God. He tells you where it is. What does he call this city of the living God? The heavenly Jerusalem. Look at me. What I'm talking to in this room today is a heavenly Jerusalem. If you're born again and washed in his blood. Everything you're reading here is describing salvation. Everything. Now you see a new name for salvation. It's called the heavenly Jerusalem. Is that right? Talk to me. Is it there? And all this is what has happened to you when you came to Jesus. You see, if you, know, if you said, well, I wish there was another term that I could describe in using what does it mean when I came to Jesus, then I would say, you came to Zion. You became a citizen of Zion. See, we're his ambassadors. You've come to the heavenly Jerusalem, to the mirrors of angels. Well, see, did he not say that the angels of God encamp around those that fear him? See, the angels of God only walk around those that are walking around the heavenly Jerusalem. When he said, come here, let me show you the bride, and I saw the heavenly Jerusalem coming down from above. You just said, hey, that was me. That was my salvation receiving of the Lord that he provided for me at Calvary. I became a citizen of heaven. And all those jewels you see described there, that's what you look like inside. You're looking at the jewels that are the beauty of holiness. And we try to look at it in natural thinking. Go, jewels. Look what he says. He says, you've come to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who enrolled where? They enrolled in heaven. You've come to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of righteous men made perfect, you've come to Jesus. It's amazing how easily you can accept that statement. How about all the rest? You can't accept this statement that you've come to Jesus unless you accept all the rest. That's what's been happening. We've tried to accept this part about Jesus and said, one of these days, I'll be in the heavenly Jerusalem. One of these days, I'll be in that place of that city of the living God. You're in that place now. What do you think Elijah did to his servant? He said, Lord, open his eyes so he can see. The Spirit of God's going to open your eyes so he can see. You've come to Jesus, the media of a new covenant. You've come to the sprinkle of blood which speaks better than the blood of Abel. Jesus' blood is in glory, testifying concerning you every time you go there. I'm the proof they've been washed. I'm the proof they've been redeemed. I'm the proof they're justified. His blood speaks, the Bible says, of better things than the blood of Abel. Can you imagine the, the blood of Jesus testifying for all eternity that you have been washed, that you've been forgiven, that you've been redeemed, that you have been justified? And God says, because you've come to that place, here's a warning for you. Look at verse 25. He says, see to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if those did not escape when they refused him who won them from the earth, that was when they had just a law. Must less shall we escape who turn away from him who warns from heaven? And his voice shook the earth then. That's when they only had the law. They didn't have his, his cross. But now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. And this expression, yet once more, denotes the removing of those things which can be shaken, as of created things, in order that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable sacrifice with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Is that in your Bible? Say it with me. I don't feel like it. I don't even see it. But I've come to the heavenly Jerusalem. 
Look what it says in Philippians 3. Verse 17. Is all power and heritage is in his, in, in his hands? Philippians 3, 17. Brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern that you have in us. Folks, you are supposed to have the pattern of Jesus Christ inside you. Verse 18, and this many here are the same many that's enlisted in Matthew 7. They go the broad way. They go the way of ease of their flesh. For many walk, verse 18, of whom I often told you and now tell you even weeping that they are enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is going to be destruction. See, they're refusing him that's speaking. Whose God is their appetite. The King James says belly. Now, that's not talking about men or women with fat bellies. But it's giving us a picture of something. It's saying to us, there's some people in this world, all they want is to eat, sleep, and drink, and be merry. And I've seen many people like that. They'll say, well, I would come to God if he would bless my finances. That's all they care about. That's what can God do for them. Never what their part is to be for God. Whose glory is in their shame, and, and look at their minds. They set their minds on what? Earthly things. What do you think the prosperity, charismatic message was about? It, it was a delusion to train the people of God to become enemies of the cross. And we bought it. I know because I used to preach it. I'm telling you, it's from the pits of hell. Look at verse 20. We just saw in Hebrews that we belong to the heaven of Jerusalem, right? Look at verse 20. For our citizenship is in where? It's in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory. How does he do it? By the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. That's all we're waiting for is just Jesus. Amen? Everything now is summed up in him. Go to Daniel 7. I want you to see when this power transformation took place and show you Daniel's warning how when this power would be transformed into his hands, how that Satan would immediately set up a scheme to the people of God to begin to say, well, that ain't for us today. That's for later. If you sit in the Bible, would you believe it? Mm-hmm. Let's see. Daniel 7. And this took place in the time when he said to Mary Magdalene, Mary, touch me not, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Remember that story in John? Here is where he had to go first. The moment he was raised from the grave, he had a meeting with God that the scriptures might be fulfilled. And Daniel saw it. And here's what took place. And when Daniel saw this, can I tell you something? He couldn't understand it. It totally wiped him out in physical strength. I wonder why when I talk on these things, I get always get all tangled up. Nobody else does. Daniel 7, verse 9. He says, I kept looking until thrones were set up. I wonder who those thrones are for. It's for us. Are we seated with him in heavenly places? And the Ancient of Days took his seat. Who is the Ancient of Days? God the Father. His vesture was like white snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was ablaze with flames. And a river of fire was flowing and coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands were attending him. And myriads upon myriads were standing before him. Can I tell you those are those mighty angels? Just been waiting to be sent out to those of us that are heirs of salvation. The court set and the books were open. I kept looking because of the sound of the boastful words which the horn was speaking. This is Satan. I kept looking until the beast was slain and his body was destroyed and given to the burning fire. We just saw that in Revelation chapter 20. Daniel saw the same thing. He saw what would happen to Satan. God was showing him the fullness of time. Daniel didn't know what he was looking at. He says, as for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away. 
but an extension of life was granted them for an appointed period of time. And I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. Folks, who is the son of man? It's Jesus. And he came up to the ancient of days. So this is Jesus coming up to who? God the Father. He was presented before him. This is right after he had ra was raised from the grave, from the dead. And to him was given what? Dominion. What else was he given? Glory. Did he say, Father, glorify me? Was he glorified then? What else was he given? A kingdom. That all the peoples, nation and men of every language might what? Serve him. And here's what it says about his kingdom and dominion. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. Look how Daniel feels about it, verse 15. But as for me, my spirit was distressed within me, and the visions in my mind kept alarming me. Do you see that? He don't know what it means. And now God begins to give him the interpretation of what he just saw. I approached one of those who were standing by and began asking him the exact meaning of all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. These great beasts which are four in number are four kings who will arise from the earth. But the saints, don't miss that, the saints. It doesn't matter what happens in the earth. Amen? Look at the saints of God. There's two pictures here. What's taking place on the earth? But at the same time, what's taking place with the saints of God? That's why I don't care who's president. They can have Bush and Dukakis and the whole kitchen caboodle of them serving at once. It's not going to affect me any. But the saints of the highest one will receive what? The kingdom and possess the kingdom forever for all ages to come. I'm going to skip on down to verse 21 because we're going to talk about all these different world powers. I kept looking, and that horn was waging war with the saints and overpowering them. Until the Ancient of Days came, and judgment was passed in favor of the saints of the highest one, and the time arrived when the saints took possession of the kingdom. Then he said, the fourth beast will be a fourth kingdom on the earth, which will be different from all the other kingdoms, and we will devour the whole earth and tread it down and crush it. Can I tell you this is the false church? Let me show you what he'll do, verse 25. And he will speak out against the Most High. He will wear down the saints of the highest one. And here's what Satan's doing. And he will intend to make alterations in what? Times and in law. And they'll be given into his hands for a time, times, and half a time. That means for a season, God will let this deception blind his people. Can I tell you what, say something? i got good news for you. That season has ended, and God is revealing himself to his people. But the court was set for judgment, and his dominion will be taken away, annihilated, and destroyed forever. And the sovereignty, the dominion, and the greatness of all the kingdoms of the whole heaven will be given to the people of the saints of the highest one. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all the dominions will serve and obey him, at this point, the revelation ended, and as for me, Daniel, my thoughts were greatly alarming me, and my face grew pale, but I kept the matter to myself. You catch what he just said to us? One of the ways that Satan wears you and I out is to simply make alterations in times. You see, if Jesus is reigning and ruling now, what master plan he had using Schofield and people like Day to tell us, this is for down there later on. Don't worry about it now. Just rest. One of these days, he'll come. He'll give you his power and authority, and he'll set up his kingdom on earth, and you'll have peace. The sad thing is, we bought it. Let me show you how it was prophesied, what Jesus would do when he come. Would you please go to Zechariah, the sixth chapter? Do you people understand something? That it was against God's laws in the earth for a person to be a priest and at the same time be a king? Did y'all know that? 
In fact, who was the king that got in trouble because he went into the, uh, to offer a sacrifice to God as a high priest? Was it Uzziah and the, uh, and the, and the uh, leprosy broke out on his forehead when they tried to tell him to get out of there because he was a king and he didn't belong there with the priest? They got leprosy. I want you to see this. How do we know when Jesus is reigning and ruling? Here's a sign for you. Am I tell you something else? I might as well say this to you. If you're born again and saved, do you belong to yourselves? Who do you belong to? Guess what God does with you? He turns you into one of his symbols for the world. Am I going to tell you that? Well, I'm going to show you that, but I think I'm going to show it to you. You want to see it? You see, when you go out there planting seeds, like this man did last at the rock concert, he don't know it, but that was God using him for a symbol. Every one of us that have a part in ministry, we're just signs and symbols. That's why you don't worship us, you worship Jesus. Zechariah 6, 12, then say to him, thus says the Lord of hosts, behold, a man whose name is what? Branch, so don't miss that, okay? What is this branch gonna do? Now before I show you that, back up for just a moment and go to Zechariah 3 about this branch. Now listen, Joshua, Joshua 3, excuse me, Zechariah 3, verse 8. Now listen, Joshua, the high priest, you and your friends who are sitting in front of you. Indeed, they are men who are a symbol, which means all we are are just representatives of Jesus Christ. We're reflecting him. We're just a symbol. They are a symbol, for indeed, I'm going to bring in my servant, the who? The branch. Now let's see who his servant is. Go back, please, to the sixth chapter. Say to him, 12th verse, Thus says, Lord, behold, a man whose name is Branch. And what it says in Hebrew, his name is Sprout. He will branch out from where he is. Got a question. Where is Jesus right now, people? He's on the throne at the right hand of the Father. Is that right? He's going to begin to branch out from the throne, and he will build what? The temple of the Lord. Got a question. Does it not tell you in 1 Corinthians 3 that you and I are the temple of the Lord? How about that? He's not building anything in natural Israel. Don't you understand that the veil has been torn in half and now it's whosoever will may come and drink the waters of life freely? The other thing you can get, you, get crucified about is to make the same mistake that Paul made and to tell you the Jews are not special people anymore. But today we're a spiritual Israel. That's what the book of Galatians is about. Look what it says. He will branch out from where he is, and he will build the temple of the Lord. Yes, it is he who will build the temple of the Lord, and he will bear the honor and set and rule where? On his throne. Now, is he king on his throne? Here's the part that doesn't fit anyone else but Jesus. Thus he will be a what on his throne? Priest. priest on his throne, and the council of peace will be between the two offices. Because his blood's been shed. Do you see that? Let me just tell you about these visions in chapters 1 through 22. There's seven of them. Vision 1 is found in chapters 1 through 3. It's a picture of Jesus Christ ruling and reigning in the middle of the church while the church is still in the world. From chapters 4 to chapter 7, it's the second vision. And there you find his church undergoing trials, persecutions, rejections, and everything else. But Christ is with them to bring them through it. The third vision is found in chapters 8 to 11. There you find the church is protected and is always triumphant because Jesus is ruling. The fourth vision is chapters 12 to 14. Here is where Jesus begins to stand up to oppose Satan's work in the church. Chapters 15 
16 is vision 5 is wrath to everyone who won't repent on the earth the sixth vision is the fall of Babylon and the beast and the seventh vision is what we looked at a little today the judgment of Satan and Jesus eternally ruling and reigning the lamb is, the lamb is reigning say with me the lamb is reigning now let's go back to Revelation chapter 1 and let's see what John saw and when we see Jesus as John saw Jesus can you imagine what a shock this must have been to John when he once saw Jesus as he would see me or you man of flesh and blood and then he goes into the heavenly realm and guess what he sees Jesus and Jesus comes to him my Bible still falling apart just had this thing rebound and now the papers are beginning to turn brittle watch what happens here here we go John 1 verse 7 behold he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him even those who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him even so a man and Jesus identifies himself he says I'm the Alpha which means I'm the beginning and the Omega which means everything is summed up in me now says the Lord God who is who was and who is to come the Almighty and John gives his testimony he says, I, John, your brother and fellow partaker in the tribulation. Now, don't miss that. Because, you see, another doctrine is a tribulation period. <laughs> the tribulation period has been going on ever since Jesus ascended to the earth, folks. He said, in the world, you will have what? Tribulation. Okay? I'm sure there's going to be a sum total of tribulation when the wrath begins to fall. But for the people of God, we're going through tribulation. And you're going to see a bunch of people come out of the tribulation, which means they come out of the world. Okay? And John is saying, I'm in tribulation. He's, I'm in two places. Think about this. In other words, I've lived with Jesus, but you know what he says? I'm not living a life in a bed of roses and ease. He's because I'm totally committed to Christ. I'm existing in two realms. In this world, I'm in tribulation, but in his world, I'm in the kingdom of God. Look what he says. I, John, your brother, and fellow partaker in the what? In the tribulation. And what? Kingdom. Well, what, is he given up because of the tribulation? Look, he says, and perseverance, which are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos. Why was he put there in James? Because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. You know what's amazing about that? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you. I'm going to show you now. This is going to happen to every one of us that truly turn everything we are and everything we got over to Jesus. Would you please go to Revelation 13? First of all, was John put there because of the testimony of, but because of the word of God, the testimony of Jesus? Okay. Would you say that the enemy was waging war against him to give up? Uh-huh. I'm so glad you know that. Look what it says here. Revelation 12, verse 13, verse 17. I told you, Revelation 13 is Revelation 12. And the dragon was enraged with the woman. Folks, who is the dragon? Here's a symbol again. Again, it's not Puff the magic dragon. So the word Satan got enraged with the true woman. That's the church. Or you're not called the bride of Christ? Okay, watch this. And he went off to make war with the rest of what? Her offspring. Are you part of that offspring? Who does Satan make war with? There's your, there's your tribulation. Those who keep the commandments of God and they hold to the testimony of Jesus. Do you see that? Go back to Revelation 1. John tells you why he was there. He says, I'm on this island because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Here's a man in his late 80s or early 90s. He's having to work in a hot marble mine in chains the rest of his life. And I was in the spirit, he says, on the Lord's day. Nobody says the Lord's day? You see, whenever an emperor of Rome ascended up on the throne, it was called Emperor's Day. And so the people of God start calling their day, when their Lord ascended, the Lord's Day. In other words, if an emperor went to Rome, ascended on the throne of Rome on a Tuesday, guess what? Every Tuesday was called Emperor's Day. And they would worship the emperor on every Tuesday. 
When Jesus rose from the grave and sent to the Father, it was on a Sunday. So guess what? The Christians reacted to that and said, we got the Lord's day. When he ascended and began to reign in the rule. Just like when the Roman king ascended on his throne and began to reign in the rule. They clearly understood this. We didn't. He said, I heard behind me a loud voice like, like the sound of a trumpet. Folks, did he say he heard a trumpet or did he say he heard a voice like a trumpet? Wow. See, notice the symbolism? It begins immediately with the symbolism. Saying, write in a book what you see and send to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamum, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me, and having turned, I saw, here's the symbolism, seven golden, what? Lampstands. Can you imagine seeing that? And in the middle of the lampstands, one like a son of man, or the son of man, clothed in a robe, reaching to the feet. Matthew, that's a robe of a judge. And girded across his breast with a golden girdle, and his hair and his hair, his head and his hair were like were white, like white wool. That means total wisdom, like snow. And his eyes were like a flame of fire, and his feet were like burnished bronze. He's come for judgment. He judges in righteousness. When it has been caused to glow in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. What was his voice like the sound of? Have any of y'all ever been to Buffalo, New York, and went to Niagara Falls in here? You have, sister? Did you hear the sound of that water? Was it awesome? That means when God speaks, it thunders. You see, he's looking at the man. He used to lay his head upon his breast. He ain't the same man no more. He's now in total glory. And John, like Daniel, turns a little pale. See, until you begin to recognize this Jesus that you're praying to is not some little buddy-buddy. See, I practice seeing Jesus like this, and I get chills all over me. I'm praying to total power. I'm praying to total glory. I'm praying to total God. And he's total man. Look what it says. That means he spoke with total authority. Verse 16. And in his right hand he held seven stars. Again, people, notice the symbolism. So far we see Jesus in symbolism. We see everything he's got around him in symbolism. And out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. Folks, now look. If you try to interpret this literally, you know what kind of picture you get? You get a man opening his mouth and a big butcher knife's coming out. Am I telling the truth? But notice what he's saying. Symbolism. He told you that. He said he sent and signified it or communicated it, signified it by signs and symbols. And from the time he opens his eyes in the spirit, he sees nothing but signs and symbols. And those wonderful little suffering Christians there, through the time of the, of the reign of this evil king, when they got this book, it was like a breath of fresh air and water to them. And his face was like the sun shining in its strength. I could take you over there and show you that when we seek his face, it causes us to be transformed into his glory. And when there are people with no prayer life, not before the face of God, they're dying, even while they claim they're living. His face was like the sun shining in its strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as a dead man. What do you think you would have done? He laid his right hand upon me, saying, Don't be afraid, I am the first and the last. The living one, and I was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore, and I have the keys of what? Yes. Death and what else? And of hell. I told you he was the angel with that key. Well, when did he get that key? We already saw when Daniel told us he got it, right? I want you to go with the book of Matthew and show you how even this book testified about this key of all power. Matthew 28, verse 18. 
Is this still making sense to you? I'm going to ask you a question. Is this making sense to you? Is all power in the Lord's hand today? Here's a testimony of Jesus. John said, bore witness to the testimony of Jesus. Here's part of what Jesus testified. Everything I saw, he said, bore witness to the testimony of Jesus. Here's the testimony of Jesus out of his own mouth. Matthew 28, verse 18. Jesus came up, spoke to them, saying, would you please read that out loud to me? All authority has been given to me where? In heaven and on earth. You see that, folks? That's what John just said. Let's go back and see what he said. Jesus says, verse 18, I'm the living one. I was dead. And behold, I'm alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and of hell. Write, therefore, the things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall take place out of these things. As for the mystery, which means the explanation of the symbols, of the seven stars which you saw at my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, he tells you what the symbols mean. The seven stars are the what? Angels of the seven churches. By the way, the word angel means messenger. Can you imagine what some of these preachers must have felt like when they got this letter from John saying, read this letter to your church to tell them what true state your church is in? And I said to myself, I can imagine a super cat preacher today bragging about he's got the world's biggest church and his satellite ministries and networks, and all of a sudden, God sends forth a messenger in the church and says, God told me to give you this letter to read to your people. And yet to read to your people, you become a harlot. I'm not even with you anymore. Can you imagine the impact this must have had in those churches? The first thing he begins to deal with is the church of Ephesus. It was at Ephesus that Paul began his ministry, one of the most powerful revivals to ever take place. And it was out of Ephesus all the other churches that we're going to read about, the other six, sprang forth. And guess what happened to Ephesus? They got so carried away with all the power of God being displayed in their midst, they stopped loving Jesus and started loving the signs and the wonders and the miracles and the power of God in their midst. And Jesus said, you're about to be cast into hell. Now we're going to read this. That's why I'm not impressed with who prophesies or who don't prophesy. I've seen enough of these flesh shows, haven't y'all? Look what it says. He says the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Is that in your hands? Is that in your Bibles? To so the angel of the church in Ephesus, right, the one who holds the seven stars. You might want to circle seven stars to put the angels or the messengers in his right hand. The one who walks among the seven golden lampstands. You know Jesus has been walking among this church every meeting? Did you know that Jesus is walking among us here today? You know how I know? He said, when there's two or three gathered in my name, I'm in the midst. And we're here to talk about the glorified Jesus today. Don't you know he's with us? And don't you know I know the judgment of this book that says, woe to the one that adds to this book? Woe to the one that takes away from this book? Why do you think we got so many sickly Christians? I held this book with kids' loves. It's not a game to me about this book. But I know that if I'm willing to trust him to give me the understanding of this book, he'll do that also. Because he tells me not to fear anything, but just to fear him. Amen? He says, I know your deeds. I know your toil and your perseverance and that you cannot endure evil men. And that you put to the test those who call themselves apostles. You do it by putting them to the test of the word. And they are not, and you found them to be false. And you have perseverance and you have endured for my name's sake. You haven't grown weary. But I have this against you, that you've left your first love. Folks, when they first got saved at Ephesus, they were so turned on with Ephesus. Let me tell you, it's amazing what happened in that city. A riot broke out. They'd been worshiping uh, Athena and, and Venus, I think it was. And uh, I ought to go into Acts because when I read this, but I know what happened in that city. It was in that city where all of Paul's hell began to come against him. And he was crying out about this Athena being really being God and everything else. But there was a mighty revival that sprung up in that city. In Ephesus, for, listen to this, for 40 years, this revival was burning with a fury. You go to Ephesus today, what you find out? 
They got removed because they never repented. They kept worshiping the signs and the wonders and the miracles. Every church that we're going to read about got removed. Look what he says. He says, I have this against you that you've left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first, which means you did the deeds at first because you loved me so much. Not because you were busy building your ministry. Or else I'm coming to you and I will remove your lampstand out of its place except you do what? Repent. Yet this you do have that you hate the deeds of the Nicotolaitans, which I also hate. We know the, de the deeds and the doctrines of the Nicotolaitans is once saved, always saved. We know that, don't we? He said, he that has an ear, that means a spiritual ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. See, God called us all to be overcomers. Is that right? And to the angel of the church in Smyrna, write. Let me tell you about Smyrna. Smyrna was a place where they had heavy persecution. And it was a city that was known for their work unions. Let me tell you about the work unions. See, unions is not something new. The work unions attracted people to it with their sex orgies. A mammoth amount of food. And the Christians would say, I'm not going to take part in those sex orgies. I'm not joining that union. And so Smyrna was known for Christians, wow, not having jobs. You listen to me? Because the Christians said, I'd rather die first than to do something that's going to cause me to deny Jesus. And so Smyrna was under some of the heaviest persecution because if the Christians didn't have jobs, then the word went out, they're a bunch of lazy bellies. And you could take their homes, you, you could be a, a person of the world, and you know a Christian across the street from you had a nice house? You could go there and take their house, and the, and the law would back you. They'd say, those no good Christians, they don't deserve to have in the first place. And you were just out. That's what talked about, you endured the siege of your property. Remember that? Paul talked about that. And you kind of the cause he talked about, how much we love Jesus. Let me just stop because we're not going to get this on tape anyway. The rest of the day I'm going to pick up it tonight because I'll be speaking in Sunday's place. Let's just all stand and I'll just leave you with Smyrna. Smyrna. Just pray out loud with me. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus. I, know I know that you're God. I know that you're Lord. Know that you're Lord. And that you're reigning and ruling now. And I renounce all these false doctrines. And I break their power over my heart. And I ask you to come into my heart, Lord Jesus, and to shine, and to shine for, for, and to live, and to, live, and to rule and reign, and to rule and reign as, king as king over all that I am. Fill me with the revelation of the knowledge of you. Wash out of me. All these false lies that has held me in bondage and in prison up to this time. Satan, false doctrines, by the authority of Jesus' name, your power is broken over my life. Go in Jesus' name. Amen. Now just thank the Lord for that. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for opening our eyes. Thank you for opening our understanding. Lord, intensify this in us, that we'll walk as overcomers in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Well, we're dismissed, and uh, I'll pick up the night if you can come. Fine, if you can't, just get the tapes. Amen. Is this making sense to you now a little bit better?